first thing is to thank the people in my lab, past and present. Um, I've been running, running a lab for about 30 years. Thank you. Um, so you can imagine that's a lot of people. Um, and of those people, I mean, it's impossible to make a list. It's impossible to thank them all. Just wanted to stress that um, we're talking about something like uh, 160, 170 postdoctoral fellows from everywhere in the world, about 10 sabbatical professors also from everywhere in the world, and then he said only a handful of students, PhD students, and that's my uh, big problem. I realize that. So I want to first start thanking Merlin Cervantes, the only PhD student I already had, I already had at UCI. She's here. Thank you, Merlin. I also like to thank my mentors. My mentors, I'm talking about Pierre Chambon uh, in France, uh, one of the most rigorous, hardworking, uh, serious, and um, intellectually stimulating person I ever met. He's now 88, but uh, we still love him. I'm talking about plural because Emiliana was also postdoc with him. Uh, and the other fellow is Inder Verma, who is, uh, um, was at the Salk Institute. And then to my collaborators, uh, and again, too many to thank. Uh, but um, let's thank at least the ones here at UCI. That's easy. Um, and I'd like to start by thanking uh, Erico Graton, Pierre Bali, uh, Selma Masri is here as well, and of course, Emiliana Borelli, she's a professor also in the School of Medicine, and uh, most of you know her. Then to my collaborators, again, too many to mention. So. Please just tell them if you see them. I think. Now to our leadership at UCI. When I talk about leadership, I'm really talking about from every possible level, uh, starting from our chair, Peter Kaiser, um, uh, to the top, which is uh, our uh, you know, uh, great, if you see, Enrique Lavernia, as well as uh, our uh, chancellor, Howard Gilman. Um, um, but also, most of all, people in the dean's office in the School of Medicine, I'd like to thank Suzanne Sandmeyer, and also especially our dean, Mike Stamus, for his vision uh, and his support to our Center for Epigenetics and Metabolism. Uh, the support from the School of Medicine has been critical for the success of our center. Obviously, I'd like to thank my family um, uh, in time, and I'll tell you why I'll thank Tam. But also, I want to thank another person here um, that is not in the list because he's way more important than anyone else. And there's someone here uh, and is somehow responsible um, for uh, Emilian and I to be here. That's Eric Stembridge, emeritus professor here at UCI. Because of him, that's, that's his fault, uh, but we are here. All right, let's talk about time. Um, Time is so important for everybody. We all feel that it's crucial. It goes by. And then as soon as we age, shit, time is getting shorter and shorter, right? And then it's like, time is really important. And if we should tell young people that time is important, let's use it at the best. But time is important in everything we do in biology, in, um, in medicine, uh, in our everyday life. Um, and sometimes we wish to stop time or we wish to expand it. Um, um, and so I decided to show you a little thing. And now to thank you for your generosity, I have something for you. It's a stopwatch, an old family heirloom. <laughs> what do you do with it? I mean, it doesn't keep time, it's just a stopwatch. That is a fact. But it is yours. <laughs> It works. I push the button, I stop the watch, and I stop the world. Blue G, all you guys, have I got something to show you? Pay attention. <clears throat> With this little gizmo, I can stop trains, tanks, subways, anything. As of tomorrow evening, McNulty is going to be loaded. <laughs> Ah, I'll have it fixed. Oh, please, come on, wake up. 
Oh, you, mister, please say something. Do so I'm sorry I took the money. I don't care about the money. All I want is to hear people say something again and to see people moving again. Oh, doesn't anybody know how to make this thing work again? Someone help! Help me! He doesn't care about the money anymore. He wants the time back. And that's what we try to work on, especially time in biology. So what I'm going to tell you about today is how time is controlled within our own body by special machineries that then somehow control everything we do. Whether we wake up in the morning, we have a, a lunch or a meal, we go for exercise, or we go back to sleep, so the sleep wake cycle. Um, all this work is done in the Center for Epigenetics and Metabolism, as I mentioned before, that is here on the top floor on the Sprague building. Let's start by telling you about one of my heroes, Giuseppe Arcimboldo. This is an amazing artist from Italy that somehow is not, well, it's not known as should be. Um, his work is uh, um, presented at the Louvre in Paris. In the 1500, he was painting people with food, especially uh, vegetables or fruits. Um, he was already thinking 200 years ahead about we are what we eat, as Ludwig Feuerbach, a famous German philosopher, said. I tried to apply that to myself and to be careful as well about this. Um, specifically, being Italian and being now in the US, we got to be really careful. <laughs> so, So let me tell you about, about a little bit about history and where we come from. I'm going to talk about we again, because we're talking about both Emilian and I, who we came here together. Our lives started in this place, Naples, Italy. Not a bad place to be or to be born in. Um, it's the home of the, uh, the oldest public university in the world, funded in 1224. That's about 740 years before UCI. Don't get upset. It's not a bad thing, but um, uh, if you guys ever want to go visit, just let us, let us know. We'll organize a trip and go to the Amalfi Coast, Capri, beautiful, great food, great wine. Anyway, after our PhD, um, what we did was to decide to go and explore the North. Um, and by doing so, we decided to do so because the reason was to go and work with Pierre Chambon, the best molecular biologist at the time, in Europe. Um, the only problem with Pierre is was living in a place called Strasbourg, where the weather wasn't precisely like in southern Italy, but we got adapted, so we spent several years there. Don't laugh, I had hair. <laughs> I know that's what you're thinking. I, I had hair. So with Emiliano, we went there and we spent um, five wonderful years as a postdoctoral fellows with Pierre. Um, before to embark in our first, I will call it, Californian exploration. That happened to be at the Salk Institute down the road in San Diego. Um, I mean, I was with Ron Evans, I was with Inder Verma. We'd done three amazing years of postdoctoral uh, stage. We were, luckily, because as Dick said, luck is important as well in our business. We were very lucky, but our postdoctoral time was quite successful was so successful that um, the same guy, Pierre, said, come back, come back. So we went back. Thank God, in the meantime, uh, thanks to uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, um, the institute in Strasbourg was better. <laughs> and it was a beautiful institute where we spent many, many years. Um, funny enough, this institute was built, in, in, in ar the architect for this was a guy named Ken Korberg, the third son of Arthur Kornberg, Nobel Prize for Chemistry, Pierre was a postdoctoral fellow with Arthur Kornberg. So that's a pretty cool story. Anyway, in this institute, I started working on gene expression, which was still my love and has been my love all my life, trying to understand how genes work. And at the time, uh, we were working on a gene controlling neuroendocrine responses. And I have no reason to tell you the details here. Fact is, the gene is called CREM. And we had this paper uh, 
disgustingly enough, published in 1993. We talked about 26, I don't know, so many years ago. Really, really sad. Anyway, um, we were working on this, this gene called CREM, and this German postdoc right here um, comes to me and tells me, I want to study this gene in the brain. And at the time, my brain wasn't working properly, so I said, who cares about the brain? He's like, let's check it out. And he comes up with this picture right here. The picture of the expression of this gene exclusively, uniquely, in the place called the pineal gland. Now, what is the pineal gland? A French colleague, René Descartes, um, uh, described the pineal gland as um, the center of the soul or the, the third eye. The reason for that is because the, the embryonic cells that will make the pineal gland uh, are the same ones that will make the retina. So as much that in fishes and reptiles um, and birds, the pineal gland is photoresponsive, -res just like the retina. I had no idea what the pineal gland was, so I went to read it. And this cover that makes the hormone melatonin, which I'm sure must be known to all of you. All right, so I told the German postdoc to go and do more molecular analysis trying to understand what this gene was doing there. And I told the technician in the lab to redo the experiment. Not because I didn't believe the German postdoc, but you never know, you won't always. All right, let's redo the experiment anyway. And she comes up with this, uh, this picture right here. Oops. So there was a problem. Either the French technician was wrong or the German postdoc was wrong. They were both right, in the sense that the German postdoc was a night bird and will work late at night and will sacrifice the mice at night. And the technician was rightly so doing her job and coming to the lab eight in the morning. So we discovered that this gene was expressed in what we call an oscillatory, cyclic manner, circadian manner, and I'll tell you that in a minute. Um, to me, this was, whoa, like surprisingly beautiful. Uh, I didn't know until that time that this could be possible. So what I did was to um, try to understand what Pelnia Gland was doing and start a collaboration with another fellow, uh, a pretty cool fellow, Solomon Snyder at Johns Hopkins. And with him, we discovered that uh, the expression of this gene in the pineal gland controls the synthesis of the hormone melatonin. So I was so proud about this discovery so many years ago. Um, then I went back to Naples to tell my mother. And I, and I was going back to Naples to see my mother all the time. My dad died several years before that. So I will go and see her just to keep her company. So like mother, we, I think, believe we discovered what controls the hormone melatonin. And she looks at me. And she picks a magazine from the table, like this. And she was pretty upset by showing me this. Like, so, that's what you're doing? It's like, <laughs> it's like, no mother, believe me, I'm better than that. <laughs> she had this melatonina in the cover of the magazine, and she felt, that's, that's my bro. So it's like, when are you going to finally get a job? <laughs> And stop doing, doing this science thing, anyway. Um, so at the time, the field of circadian biology was awesome. It was beautiful. It looked like this. It looked like a beautiful, pristine Caribbean beach. You could go and swim everywhere, get on the top of the palm tree, look over the other island, do whatever, really whatever you wanted. The field was awesome. There was so much to do, so much to discover. Um, after 25 years, the field is a bit different and looks like this now. <laughs> so we need really to find our little space in here, in here, really hard. Um, thank God, I'm really blessed by a number of great postdoctoral fellows in the lab and great collaborators so that we can uh, really do something that has not been done elsewhere in the world. So what is circadian and what we're really talking about? So really, circadian is based on the most ancient thing we have, is the rotation of the planet on its own axis. And it comes from Latin, it means about 24 hours. Those are a cycle of 24 hours, 
that are controlling everything happening on this planet. And this is the basis of the field called chronobiology from the chronos in ancient Greek. Chronos was um, so important for ancient Greek mythology that Kronos was the father of Zeus. So he was the father of the most important god that time. So um, how time has been really developing on this planet and what has happened? Well, what has happened is that we went through evolution, unless you don't believe in evolution, as uh, unfortunately some do. Um, this is a little schematic of the evolution. Now, um, I realized that for some reason our brain doesn't compute years or, um, I don't know, uh, distances. You tell someone, oh, I'm living at 10,000 kilometers away or 20,000 kilometers away, whatever. It's a double, but people don't compute. Uh, and years is the same. So let's talk about money. Um, that works, everybody compute money, right? So instead of look at 4.5 billion years, think about 4.5 billion dollars. Right? It, that's a lot of money. So life started on this planet four billion dollars ago. And through uh, several stages, which I'm not going to go and tell you about, um, the most important is the last one called the Holocene, which is not shown here. But this is like a, one of those um, uh, you know, little maps you see in a subway. You're here. That is $10,000. That's the past 10,000 years. That's what we really call history. All the rest is prehistory. So life has started four billions years ago, or a billion dollars ago, compared to $10,000. Um, that gives an idea of what we are. We are biological machines that have been wired through circuits and evolution. Those wired circuits we cannot forget. They're there. We cannot going to change them. So what are circuit rhythms? In, we all know, like it's if I to look at a parking lot. Um, fills up in the morning, empties at night. Um, this is what we do. Our life lives at a 24 hours beat. This is in England. It's going to start raining in a minute, although we've been having a lot of rain recently. But um, we can see that at UCI parking lot. Our life is timed specifically on that clock. The very first fellow who studied uh, and really put the finger on circuitous rhythms is this French naturalist and philosopher, Jean-Jacques de Meran. So this fellow noticed that the plant heliotrope will change and move the leaves with a 24-hour cycle. He thought it was simply the light-dark cycle. It was just the light, the sun, doing the job. Then he discovered that those leaves would do the same job in the darkness. So the light alone was not alone, was not an accessory. There was something intrinsic to that clock in the plant that will allow the plant to work with the 24-hour cycle. It's what we call free-running clocks. Clocks are free-running. We don't need the light-dark cycle. The light-dark cycle is required to adjust us for seasons or jet lag. So this on the top is a mimosa plant. The opening and closing of the leaves show a beautiful 24-hour cycle. One at the bottom is a mouse, and its activity shows a 24-hour cycle. But those two life forms are doing so in darkness as well. They don't need the light. So there's an intrinsic clock in every single organism on this planet. And I think it's beautiful because it tells you that this is the most ancient thing, as I just told you, about evolution. So let's see examples that, to me, are amazing. The very first one is the fly, the Drosophila fly. A genius named Seymour Benzer, who was a Caltech, had the fixation that every single behavior in humans or flies had to be linked to a gene. And in 1971, with a fellow named Ron Konopka, published that seminal paper in PNAS, showing that indeed you could mutate 
specific gene in the fly can change the normal rhythm of 24 hours. Similar beds have never gotten a Nobel Prize. They didn't need it, really. <laughs> but uh, three, these other three fellows did, only a couple of years ago, for the follow-up work. Now, how pervasive are those cycles? How much do they really impact our everyday life? I love to show this. This is now a plant. Look at the beautiful cycle of activity in its own biology. But though this we were more beautiful is the work done by NASA when they look at the planet. You can look now at the whole planet in waves of light responsiveness of plants all over the planet. You can see as soon as the light goes, it moves across the rotation of the heart. The activation is shown here in red so that those plants are becoming active because of the light dark cycle. I think it's beautiful. It tells you that this is happening every day in every place on the planet only because of that circadian cycle. Another beautiful example I'd like to show is, has to do with a mammal. And that mammal is a dolphin. So the dolphins, like a lot of other life forms, they need to take care of whatever happens around them. And dolphins are um, have predators, sharks, killer whales. So they need to be careful. What they did during that evolution, those four billion years, they developed an amazing system through which they actually sleep with half the brain at a the time. They don't sleep all the time with both heights. They sleep with half of the brain, so the other half of the brain is awake in case a predator comes around. Then in the middle of the night, they flip around, boom, and they sleep to the other side. How beautiful is that? Again, that is circadian biology and circadianly controlled. All right, so what about us? What about humans? Well, you can see in popular magazines, charts like this one. And we all have, I'm sure if you all raise the harm here, lots of us have uh, some type of device telling you how much steps, how many steps you do, uh, how much energy you're spending every day, at what time of the day. Um, but I love to look at this and, for example, um, there's a, this is the best time to go to the dentist because your pain level are lower. So if you get to go to the dentist appointment, do 2 p.m., best time. Uh, a great time, uh, and I'm talking here to my friend James, to go and play soccer, to do exercise, is around midday or around late morning because at the time, high alertness. There's even a better time to do sex, which to me is, I don't know, but best time for love, 8 in the morning, do something about it. However, if you want to go for exercise too much in the morning, really early, I don't know if sex is part of that, um, but that's also the time where you have a higher risk for uh, cardiac arrest. And, uh, and so you gotta be careful. So everything is really circadian. Everything is all around the clock. So much that if you look at the hour of physiology, uh, whether we're talking about hormones, whether we're talking about um, all these fellows in, that you know very well, insulin, glucagon, leptins, all these prolactin, melatonin, they're all beautifully circadian. Everything is circadian. Even the number, the number of cells in the blood is circadian, as is shown here. So there is a direct number of changes of cells in your blood that is driven by the clock. So where is the clock in our body? The clock is in the brain, the central clock is in the brain. What really happens every day, that the light will hit the retina, specialized cells in the back of the retina called um, uh, ganglion cells. The, the, the light signal will travel the retinal epithelial tract all the way to the back of the hypothalamus. That's where we have about 20,000 neurons. These 20,000 neurons constitute what we call the suprachiasmatic nucleus, complicated by means is a nucleus cells that's just above the optic chiasma. Um, these cells, these neurons, have the amazing capacity of uh, being cyclic and they have a rhythmic activity no matter what. You can actually take them out from the mouse, put them in culture, and they will oscillate no matter what. They're the central clock in your body. In every single mammal, that's where it is. 
But a discovery done in my lab, as well as in the lab of many other friends and colleagues, about 15, 20 years ago, showed that we have a web of clocks, a web of pacemakers. There are clocks everywhere in the body, in the liver, in the heart, in the spleen, in the muscle. Every single organ has a clock. And the question is, how the central clock in the brain is connected to those peripheral clocks, in what way we have to uncouple them. You can do that with feeding, food, it is critical, but also exercise. By doing so, you can uncouple the central clock from the old peripheral clocks, or you can actually make sure they're really nice in uh, somehow a concordance. What happens when you change things? Let's go back to that chart of the evolution. What has happened in the past 100 years? I'm not talking about 10,000 years. This is the Holocene, that's about 12,000 years. That's history. But in the past 150 years, what we have done? We have invented electric light, we got television, we got cars, we got Facebook, right? And I don't know if you guys are on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, but if you do that two in the morning, well, we'll talk about this in a second. So what happens when you disrupt the clock? You can do a lot of bad things. You disrupt the clock, in a way or another, which we'll talk about in a minute, you have bad things happening to you. Obviously, you have insomnia. The sleepwalk cycle is directly linked to the circadian cycle. You got depression and anxiety. That's the case for people living in Northern Hemisphere where there's a lot of little light, like in Finland. Yeah, it's a problem for them. Uh, that's what is called uh, seasonal affective disorder. We have metabolic disorders. We can talk about this forever. Inflammatory responses, accelerated aging, obesity, diabetes, even cancer. Suffice to say that ladies, women who work a night shift like nurses or uh, uh, flight attendants, they have about 40% increased risk for breast cancer. When you do that, here you go, when you look at the computer at two in the morning and, or whatever you want, and, uh, or your tablet, your cell phone, and you look at Facebook. Now, if you're working and you're responding to your third reviewer or definitely get to respond to, you know, Dr. Lavernia who's writing an email that you don't want to say no, right? That kind of stuff. It, it, but you gotta be careful because this is what has happened only in Los Angeles in the past 50 years. The amount of light in our area has increased not five, not two times fold, but has increased over 250 fold in the past 50 years. That's like a stick of dynamite in our normal metabolism. What are ways you have to disrupt your clock? Well, it's important what you eat and how much you eat. Everybody knows that. Don't eat too much. That's the wrong thing you gotta eat. Don't have a cheeseburger, have a salad, good. But it's also important when you do that. There's a perfect example that we call epigenetics for which we're not gonna talk about today. But you can see here two mice, but this experience has been done in humans as well. These two mice are equal. They have the same genome. They are perfectly homozygous. They're like two twin brothers. But this fellow here was, fellow, was fed at the right time of day. This fellow here was fed at the wrong time of day. So you can have a cheeseburger at, mid, at midday? Ah, midnight. Try to avoid that. That's what happens to you. The reason for that is because what we have discovered in the lab that the metabolic cycles shown here, which I definitely am not gonna tell you about, those metabolic cycles are for a large chunk, 50% at least in the liver, are run and driven by the clock itself. So if you go and take that cheeseburger at midnight, what you're really doing, you're pushing these cycles into an amazing stress, into inflammatory responses, that then are the one responsible for a number of pathologies. So what we've done recently is to really understand how food and metabolism really connect and how the clock is, con is really working in that sense. And I like to show this slide only because it's mesmerizing. But this is really, this is really like, it's a beautiful picture of the, our metabolism in the body, right? So what really happens, I'm not gonna tell you that the data or results, I'm gonna finish in a minute, but it's really to tell you something that we found out recently that I think is beautiful and uh, is really opening a lot of ide new ideas and opportunities for uh, personalized medicine, for understanding uh, you know, precision medicine and so on, is that those clocks in various tissues 
are actually connected. And the connection, these communicating clocks are really coordinating our metabolism. When you do take that cheeseburger, I mean, now you're not just disrupting the metabolism in the clock, in the liver, but what you're really doing, you're disrupting the communication between the different tissues, different organs. And that what is leading to pathologies. All right, I'm done. I'm just going to uh, tell you the last point that is uh, critical for, uh, uh, for this award. I'd like to thank the Senate. I'd like to thank uh, Linda Cohen and all the uh, award committee. But in order to get here, that's my trick. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>